If anyone has any questions over the course of the meeting today, you are welcome to unmute, though I do ask that during the meeting, unless you have a question, that you remain muted. Um, that way we can ensure that Ted isn't interrupted or disturbed due to any access noise. Otherwise, uh, my name is Will Best. I'm the museum manager here at the Champaign County History Museum. I am thankful for all that have joined tonight. Um, this is the last history talk of the year. Uh, we've got history talks booked out for the remainder of the year into next April. So I will talk a little bit more about those up and coming opportunities later on. Uh, if you have any thoughts or questions, uh, you can either put them into the chat and I can relay them. Or like I said, if you would like to just unmute yourself, you can do that as well, whichever method makes you more comfortable. Otherwise, let me go ahead and I'll introduce our speaker for today, Ted Widmer. Ted is a historian and former presidential advisor who writes widely on history, politics, and their, for and their intersection. He is distinguished a lecturer at the Macaulay Honors College of the Uni City University of New York. From 1997 to 2001, he was a foreign policy speechwriter and senior advisor to President Bill Clinton and collaborated with the former president on his memoir, My Life. He also served as a senior advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in 2012-2014. He has been particularly active in the realm of public history. From 2010 to 2015, he helped to create an ambitious series about the Civil War disunion in the New York Times and became one of its lead contributors in addition to editing the book that resulted. In 2019, he conceived and edited a year-long series in the New York Times about the global transformations of the year 1919, the year of the crack up. Also in 2019, he curated the exhibit, Walt Whitman, Bard of Democracy at the Morgan Library in New York. In addition, his writings have often appeared in the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Guardian, and the New Yorker. In 2020, his book, Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington, was published by Simon & Schuster and received the prize for the best book of the year from the Lincoln Forum and the inaugural prize for our best book from the Society of Presidential Des uh, Descendants, among other awards. He has also written or edited six other books, including a two-volume series in the Library of America, American Speeches. Today, Ted will be joining us to speak about his most recent publication, Lincoln on the Verge, and give insight into his research, his conclusions, and most importantly, to talk about the history of Lincoln's travels to the White House from Springfield. And so now, if you'll welcome me as we let Ted Widmer take the ring. Uh, thank you so much, Will. Great to be speaking with you. We're a pretty small group, so I just wanted to begin by saying I think it'll be more fun to speak in a conversational way, and I, I very much welcome your questions. And you can raise your hand or, or put it in the chat, as Will said, and I will be happy to stop what I'm saying just to address what's on your mind. Um, I, I didn't want to give a formal lecture. I already let Will know that in email that I, I wanted to speak, you know, more conversationally, like a, in a small seminar, and just tell you a little bit about how I came to write this book and what the research was like, what the moment of publication was like, which was, to be honest, really weird, because it came out about one week after COVID hit in early 2020. Uh, it came out, I think the publication date was April 7th, 2020. It was about two weeks after COVID really hit in a big way. And so all of my talks that we had meticulously arranged at you know, book tour and bookstores around the country I was going to go speak at, they were all canceled. And then, I mean, it really seemed like a washout, but then this miraculous technology of Zoom came along and I was able to speak to a fair number of people. I, I had some big Zoom conversations, a lot of small ones, and I'm just so grateful to Zoom for making these conversations possible because I, I do think, I mean, it was a struggle, but I think the, the news of the book got out there um, in the Lincoln community. There, there definitely is a Lincoln community and um, a Civil War community. And I'm grateful tonight for your attention because I, I really would like people in Illinois to know about the book. Uh, it's the land of Lincoln, as we all know. And 
one of the things I really cared about in the research was looking at every single place he went. I, I really followed it very closely. I got old maps from 1860 and 61, so I knew exactly where the train was going that he was on. And he certainly would have known because of his very extensive experience in helping Illinois railroads, the Illinois Central especially, to figure out where they were going, how to get there, how to buy the land they needed to put the trains through, how to smooth all those obstacles. That's what he was doing for a lot of the 10 years before he became president. So so I was certainly looking at Champaign County and I wrote a little bit. Um, I, I talked about his stop in Tolono and I'm really grateful to Will for helping me know how to pronounce that word because I don't think I did until, uh, until tonight. And in Homer, and in those last, those were the last moments he was ever in Illinois as he raced across Champaign County on his on his train moving to the east in February of 1861. And it was not until the train bringing his body back brought that he came back to Illinois. Um, so uh, I'm happy to to speak to all of you and answer any questions, but I might just keep going and tell you how the book happened. Uh, usually. I, I think we expect our historians to tell you that, you know, we, I, in this case, I had a very precise idea that I wanted to write a book about Lincoln being on a train. And I, I don't think it was that way. It happened more organically and, and naturally uh, as a result of some work I was doing, not in history teaching, but in journalism. And as Will said, I've, written a fair amount for newspapers, that is for a historian, but I mean, I am also in a university. I, I am around academic people and I am an academic person, but in 2010 to 2011, I was approached by some friends who were at the New York Times and they were younger editors there. And they were aware that the internet was making new kinds of journalism possible. It was a very interesting moment. And these young journalist editors were thinking they could start to put things up online on the New York Times website in sections of the website. And nobody would really care in the hierarchy of the paper because the online section was so irrelevant that that they just would let anything go in there. And, um, oh, I see your question. So let me stop for a second. Uh, regarding central Illinois. Well, I read a ton of newspapers. That That's uh, the main source for the book is, and I, I don't think I could have, written this book even 10 years earlier because the digitization of small town newspapers made a tremendous amount of information available to me. And there's a website co-sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress, and it's called Chronicling America. I'll put it in the chat. And I just found a ton of great reporting in small town newspapers from 1861. Um, oh, good. I, I love librarians too. So, um, so maybe I'll get back to that after finishing my story of how, how it started. But um, it's funny now to think of a time when the online New York Times was seen as sort of a backwater part of the paper that no one cared about because about 10 years later, 11, 12 years later, that's everything. Everything, the, the online part is the part we all go to first, most of us. I still buy the printed New York Times, but it's getting harder and harder to find. Even in New York City, it's not so easy to find. Um, and back then it was just the opposite. The internet was this unknown thing. And so my friends thought, it's 2010. It's the 150th anniversary of 1860, the year Lincoln was elected. 
why don't we do a, a short feature on the beginning of the Civil War? We'll give it a catchy name like Disunion, and we'll just find some historians to write uh, sh short pieces for us, maybe one a day. And we'll let it go a few months and we'll just maybe we'll go from Lincoln's election to his inauguration. He's inaugurated on uh, March 4th, 1861. So in theory, we were thinking, let's go from November. He's elected on November 6th, 1860. So let's go from about November to March 2010 to 11. And we'll try to get one piece a day from a historian. We'll just see how it goes. And I was uh, doing this out of love of history. I was never paid a dime, but it was fun. And as I was trying to help them find younger historians, I realized, well, I should probably do a few of these myself. And I started to, and and it was fun. It, it was a lot different from writing a history book. These were short little pieces, maybe like five or six paragraphs could do it pretty fast. You could do it in a couple hours. Um, you needed some books around, but the whole point was you weren't supposed to get too immersed in the scholarship. You were just supposed to tell a story of something that happened that day. And I found it really exciting. I am a sort of a non-academic person, even though I am an academic. I like just talking to people. So I didn't feel like I needed to do massive amounts of research. And I just would um, crank out these little pieces on what happened on November 10th, 1860, like three days after the election or December 2nd. Um, and my colleagues, friends, young historians were also sending things in. Um, one historian named Adam Goodhart wrote a lot of pieces and he later published an amazing book called 1861 that I, I highly recommend about the beginning of the Civil War. But um, I began to sort of look ahead on the calendar and think, all right, what's going on in January and February? And I realized Lincoln was getting on the train to, to leave Springfield and come to Washington. And it was 13 days in all. And I thought about it, could I do 13 days in a row where I will post a piece every day and that'll give a breather to all the other historians and it'll be a, a story, a, a, you know, a, a, it'll be day one of the train trip, day two, all the way to his arrival. So I proposed that to the editors and they said, sure, sounds good. Let's, let's do it. I mean, there was barely any thought by me or by them. But I I had a book I had bought in a used bookstore about Lincoln's train trip. It was an older book. And I had, you know, a good number of Lincoln books, big biographies. So I thought I would be okay. And I would look at the day before. I would look at what happened that I would be writing about. So I'd start to read about it the day before. And um, it, it was more than one or two hours. I mean, I I began to realize this was a great story. And I started reading four, five, six hours just to write a little thing for the next day. And slowly the um, power of the story took over. And I realized I have stumbled into a great a great story about Abraham Lincoln. I didn't even mean to do it. But in the middle of this trip, I realized how much was going on for him, that he is uh, in a kind of uncomfortable situation. He's moving quickly across the country. He's got to give a lot of speeches. He's having trouble keeping up with all of it. His voice is starting to go out. His hand is very sore from shaking thousands of hands a day. It's like the campaign that he did not actually do in 1860. He stayed at home in Springfield. But suddenly this is like a campaign. He has been elected, but he's shaking tens of thousands of hands and giving a ton of speeches. So it's like the campaign a month or two later than you might have expected it. Um, okay. he's got, yep. Don't mean to interrupt. We just had a question from chat. Uh, Tom Best asked, how did eyewitness accounts from average citizens figure into your assessment of Lincoln's trek? 
Well, a lot. I mean, the book is filled with them. I have a lot of people talking about what he looked like. If someone wrote something in a diary, I tried to find it. Um, and the newspaper accounts I mentioned earlier were often very descriptive of him. I didn't always know the name of the reporter because they didn't sign their articles very often. But uh, whenever I could find a small town account of what he looked like, which, you know, it's it's a journalist, but it's also an average citizen because this was just a young reporter probably who lived in the small town that I, I would um, devour those accounts especially looking for stories of fatigue or he's beginning to wear down during during the trip. Um, and then he's got family difficulties. He has um, sometimes problems with his wife who gets unhappy for different kinds of reasons. He has problems with his older son, Robert, who is a teenager who's beginning to drink and to have fun with people his own age. So every time they get to a big city, it's hard to find Robert. He goes out to have fun in almost all of these cities. And you know, it's a it's a real family. It's a human family and Lincoln is a human being. And it humanized him for me to follow him on this 1900 mile journey. But then also I began to realize he was in a very serious danger at many moments uh, in the trip, including as the train is racing toward Indiana through Champaign County, they get to, well, someone going ahead of the train looking for problems sees a, an obstacle someone put on the track near State Line, Indiana, that if the train, if Lincoln's train had hit at full speed, it might have taken the train off the track, you know, caused, caused a, an accident that could have been fatal. And in Cincinnati, uh, someone found a, an explosive device on the car he was about to go into just before he went into it. But then the really serious problems were centered around Baltimore, Maryland, where there was a well-developed plot of Southern sympathizers to kill him as he came through Baltimore. And it was only through really good detective work, including women as well as men, that Lincoln's friends were able to figure out this plot and he he still very courageously went through Baltimore, but he went through uh, in the middle of the night at four in the morning on an ordinary all night commuter train. And he had a different kind of jacket on and a different hat on, but that said, he didn't have a disguise and they weren't expecting him at four in the morning. So he, he got through, um, but it was you know, a real... Uh, odyssey with grave danger, as I mentioned, uh, um, and physical strain, but also he grew tremendously. So it's only 13 days, but you really see a new Lincoln emerging with um, incredible speeches, that better speeches than he had given, beginning with the day he went through Champaign County, only you know a, an hour or two before that, he gave a farewell speech in Springfield that was a brilliant speech and a new kind of a speech, a speech of humility from a man who lived in a town in Illinois saying goodbye to his fellow townsmen and townswomen in, in a beautiful language that really spoke to the American people. It was not a kind of um, fancy presidential address about all of the things he would be doing. It was just saying, I'm, I'm going to miss you. And I'm, I'm, I have a really hard job and I'm going to do the best I can. And there had never really been a speech like that. And it, it helped him. It helped explain him to a divided people he needed to lead. I mean, even in the North, people were not sure about this guy and he needed to win over the North as well as the South. I mean, half the South had already seceded and the other half would secede, but he he had really hard work ahead of him to keep people behind him. And each day of the trip, he had a formal speech written out. He'd written them out before he left, but then there were so many demands on his time. He just had to go out there and talk like a, like a person to, to, to the people gathered around the train, sometimes in a big number, like in a town square. Sometime it would just be a group of farmers in their horse and buggies at a, at a crossroads. 
in in a place like Champaign County or all the other rural counties uh, across Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and upstate New York. You know, he went through all these rural parts of America and he just grew and grew and grew. And even though it's only 13 days, I felt like there was a new Abraham Lincoln by the time he got got through the trip. So it really was a great learning experience for me. And I tried to put that excitement into the book. And I think if it had been a more academic kind of a book, I probably wouldn't have had as much excitement. So maybe I should pause there and see any more questions. Um, I was wondering, uh, are there any other stories uh, that concern your kind of average citizen? Um, you mentioned diaries. I was wondering if there were what kind of mentions were included in those kinds of situations? Well, it's usually a very brief moment in time. Like someone sees him and they hope to get up close and maybe they shake his hand and he just says like, nice to meet you. And so it's rare to find something profound in a diary. Although I remember there's a very good New York City diarist named George T. Strong who um, he talked about how haggard Lincoln looked. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, but, you know, most of the diaries are small town folks just saying, I'm so excited I got to meet the president elect. So it's interesting, but it's not like it changes your opinion of 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 Lincoln at that, that moment. Um, and I really wished, of course, that I had writings by him. He didn't keep a diary. And he didn't write letters during the trip. So I don't really have anything from him, but I do have the the record of the speeches he was giving, which actually was a lot. I mean, he's giving many speeches a day. And as he ran out of his written speeches and he had to start giving spoken speeches with no no speech in front of him, he goes to some pretty interesting places in his, in his mind. And getting, he, he's not so self-confident at the beginning of the trip and uh the night the same night he went through uh Tolono and Homer into Indiana he got to Indianapolis and he gave a speech that night to a big crowd in which he he made a pretty bad mistake he um told a kind of off-color joke that didn't resonate very well around the country and he said um you know, about the legality of secession with all these Southern states seceding. It's like they don't think of the union as a marriage. They think of it more as like a free love arrangement, meaning like when a man and a woman would get together, but not get married. And, you know, that was a pretty shocking joke for 1861. And he got <laughs> a lot of criticism. But after getting over a few of his mistakes, he gave a pretty bad speech on the economy. When he got to Pittsburgh, it was a difficult night. The train got backed up, it, it got delayed, and it was raining when he got into Pittsburgh. And it just was a, a hard situation. And he gave a speech that didn't go over very well about the economy. And he, you know, as brilliant as Lincoln was, he had soft spots. He had things he didn't know that much about. I mean, very few people knew more about slavery and what Congress was permitted to do and what it was not permitted to do relating to the states and the territories. They're not the same thing. And Kansas and Nebraska in particular, which was, you know, the, the hotbed of, of the 1850s where they were really upset about whether it would become slavery or, or not. But economy, he just wasn't that strong. And he gave a kind of a dud speech in Pittsburgh. But then he just kept getting better. And in the final two days of the speech, he gave beautiful speeches about his memory of being a child. And you know, there, there aren't a lot of moments when Lincoln talks about being young. He had a pretty painful childhood. His mother died and he was a, about nine years old and he didn't get along all that well with his father. And, but in these speeches, he starts to remember uh, what he says specifically is that he couldn't ever remember a time when he wasn't 
completely inspired by the American Revolution and the sacrifices made by the soldiers at places like um, Trenton, New Jersey, where George Washington surprised the Germans. I, I mean, yes, they were the Hessians. They were Germans, but the Hessians who were allied with the English um, and the famous painting, Washington crossing the Delawares from that night when Washington went into New Jersey kind of by stealth. And Lincoln talked about how moved he always was by the sacrifice of those men and how they must have been fighting for something more than ordinary because of what they were willing to do. And then the next day after Lincoln had gone through New Jersey, he went to Independence Hall in Philadelphia and gave a very beautiful speech about what the Declaration of Independence had always meant to him. And these were just um, gorgeous orations that came from somewhere very deep inside of Lincoln. So I felt like even though he didn't keep a diary, I was seeing something important inside of him. And that, that was very satisfying. All right, oh, Ted, uh, just to interrupt you here, we have two questions. First from Jeffrey Kinkley. Um, they were wondering that aside from the Baltimore plotters, were there any other situations where there were booing at any of the stopovers or any other dissent? Good, good question. Um, I don't remember booing, but I, I know that he was very aware of how many people in every audience were not Lincoln voters. He only won 38% of the vote. It's the second smallest percentage of a winning vote any president ever had in our history, which is kind of incredible. Our most, probably our greatest president got the second smallest percentage of the vote in our history. And I mean, there are reasons. There were four people running, not two. So so that drained away a lot of support, but still it's a very small percentage, not even 40%. And so even in the North, there were anti-Lincoln people, but also the train went pretty far South. And I thought the train route was very interesting. So after Indianapolis, it goes down to Cincinnati, which is on the Ohio River, and you can see Kentucky right from there. And he talked about that. He talked about wanting to speak to the Southerners who might be there. And um, he said great things. He said, look, uh, if you don't like my politics, he said, I'm going to try to work with everybody. But if you don't like my politics, there is a remedy. You just vote me out in four years. And it, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world, the way everyone was saying in the South. So he had a pretty good way of talking to people who didn't agree with him politically. And I don't really remember booing. I'm sure there were shouts of questions. And there are many moments where I remember him sort of talking to people in the middle of his speech or, you know, funny things would happen that you can't even imagine now, but like a very tall man would come up out of the audience and stand on the stage. It was sort of a common thing at that era to have two really tall men put their backs next to each other to see who was taller and everyone would laugh. It was almost like small town entertainment. And I, Lincoln would say this thing, you just can't even imagine it, but he'd say, um, Either he or the other guy would say, I can lick salt off the top of your head. And that was the beginning of the challenge. And then they would stand back to back. And usually Lincoln would win because he was very, very, he was 6'4". Um, but these are, you know, interesting small town encounters. And I couldn't help thinking, wow, this is democracy in action. This is pretty inspiring. All right, moving on to our next question. Another question from Tom Best. Who were the advisors with Lincoln to help with the press, and how did they help Lincoln? Another great question. Um, so he does have relationships with reporters. He knows a lot of them. There's an interesting young German immigrant who's a reporter for a New York paper. His name's Henry Villard, and Lincoln has known him for a while of uh, Villard covered the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And so there are ways in which, just like today, the people in the president's party are friendly with the reporters so they can 
affect the way a story is written. They can't quite make one happen or or stop one from happening, but they can affect it. And I think the main people in Lincoln's, I mean, there were many different kinds of people traveling with him, but um, he had two young assistants named John Nicolay and John Hay, who were both from Illinois. Um, John Nicolay is, is a German immigrant. There, there were a lot of German immigrants in the Midwest, and he's one of them. John Hay is not an immigrant, but he he's from a small town in Illinois, and he works for a while um, for... Uh, Lincoln before Lincoln is elected, and then and then Lincoln brings him and John Nicolay's, his young, they called them secretaries, but he meant assistant, and they were both very good at dealing with the press and with uh, political people who needed to get get up close to Lincoln, and Lincoln also had a lot of politically connected <laughs> Illinois advisors, most of whom were from Chicago. Um, there's a guy named Orville Browning who's on the train for part of the way. And um, he's also able to send his thoughts, either he, um, his, I mean, usually I think it was other people doing it for him, but the telegraph works in 1861. So they can get thoughts to political advisors pretty quickly. So even though it's a long time ago, it resembled a modern traveling White House in that there were all these people who could act as liaisons to the press corps or to political bosses in other states because they're always coming into someone's territory. So they need to wire ahead to the boss of Ohio or the boss of Pennsylvania or of New York to say, we'll be there at a certain time and can we have a little meeting? So so they're good at communicating. It looks like we've got one more question for the moment from Connor Munson who recalled after reading the book that Lincoln had established a relationship with Pinkerton, the famous private detective and strike breaker, and was his bodyguard during the trip. And he was wondering how did that arrangement come about? Great, uh, great question. And I, I, I know a fair amount about this from doing so much research, but the story of how they begin to know about the assassination plot around Baltimore is is really interesting. And uh, two women are involved. And the first is a woman named Dorothea Dix, who is a mental health advocate. Kind of, you know, surprising to think that far back in our history. We had people going around the country advocating for mental health. And, and what that usually meant was getting people with mental problems the care they needed. And often that meant getting a state government to build an asylum. And that that word sounds bad now. We think of terrible mental asylums, but at the time it was a step forward. It meant real care being given to people and the state taking an interest in public health. And this woman went to every state in the country to argue uh, what what she knew a lot about. And so she was welcome in Southern state capitals. She'd done a lot of good in the South as well as the North. And she was on a trip in the fall of 1860, right around when Lincoln was elected. And she began to just hear rumors that the South was going to try to kill Lincoln before he could become president. We don't know how she heard it, but she, she heard it. And being a tough She's a remarkable woman. I mean, she's traveling by herself everywhere, handling these complicated political discussions about asylums. And she just went to the president of the railroad that would bring Lincoln from Philadelphia into Washington through Baltimore. And she just went into his office. And this is how we know. He wrote about it. She did not. But he said, I had the most amazing visit today from Dorothea Dix, who laid out in total detail an assassination plot against Lincoln centered in Baltimore. And he was also a pretty confident person. So as the president of a railroad, he had a lot of resources available. And without that much time, uh, he, he sent to Alan Pinkerton, who was a railroad detective working in Chicago for the Illinois Central, and 
the head of this railroad in Philadelphia sends to Pinkerton, come, come out, I need you immediately. Pinkerton came with eight other operatives. It's kind of like a Mission Impossible movie. They come into Baltimore and they start impersonating people in Baltimore to try to win the confidence of, of the, the assassins. They don't know who they are, but they just start going into bars and restaurants with fake Southern accents, talking about how much they hate Lincoln. And eventually they find the people who are trying to kill him. And they, they get a lot of the details of the plot. And one of the best agents is a, a woman, another woman who worked for Pinkerton. So this is just great material. You know, it's an incredible story. And Pinkerton took that information and he gave it to the head of the railroad in Philadelphia. And then they arranged for Pinkerton to meet up with Lincoln when he got, uh, it was actually Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And they arranged a secret train with no markings of any kind to take Lincoln from Harrisburg to Philadelphia there they held the last train and Lincoln got in at the last minute in the back car with Pinkerton and with that woman, the spy I mentioned, and they just um, fell asleep in an ordinary seat on the train, got to Baltimore, went through at four in the morning and made it into Washington at about 6 a.m. So incredible story that you know only a few people knew about it and they were all heroes and and they may have saved Lincoln's life before he even could become president. I have another question. Going back to Illinois, aside from Lincoln's major speech in Springfield before he left, did he make any other speeches at any other cities on his way west uh, eastward? Oh, just about every one. Uh, he... Every day, so there are 13 days of the trip, and almost every day he wrote out by hand one long speech. And usually that was going to be in the state house in front of the state legislature. So he does one of those in Indianapolis. He does one in Columbus, Ohio. Um, he does, uh, he, he goes to Albany, New York, and he does greet the legislature, but it's not a long speech there. Um, but then in Trenton, New Jersey, he gives two speeches, one to the House chamber, one to the Senate chamber. Um, and then he goes to Harrisburg. So before the trip started, he was thinking one big speech in a state capitol. But then as the trip actually begins to happen, he can never escape. The responsibility of speaking because people are desperate to hear from him. He's a nearly a total stranger to everyone. And this trip, by the way, was the only time most people ever saw Abraham Lincoln. If you didn't live in Washington, D.C. during his presidency, you probably never saw him. You know, either Springfield, Illinois, or Washington, D.C. Um, and I mean, it's true as when he's young in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, he's around Southern and Central Central Illinois a lot, places like Decatur, you know. Um, but still, most Americans never saw Abraham Lincoln, except if they were lucky that during this journey and they came out in huge numbers. And I think in my book, I said that in Tolono, about a thousand people came out in a town that had a population of about 270. So everybody within 50 miles of the train came out to see him go through because they, well, they were curious about him. They didn't really know who he was. He did not have a very distinguished record. He'd only been a one-term congressman 12 years earlier, you know, so really was not that, that well known. But also the stakes were so high. Um, seven states had left the country before he even got on the train and nobody knew what was going to happen. I mean, it was, a, will it be a war? Will he let those states go? So people were very curious. They just wanted to see him and, and even more to hear him. And he understood that. So he spoke, you know, he, he must have given like 10, 15 speeches a day, so much that his voice kept giving out and he was exhausted. But I think it was an effort worth doing because I think he really won over 
a huge number of Americans during the trip. They looked at him. You know, part of it was seeing him. We we all judge people by their faces and the quality of their voices and the things that they say. And I think, by and large, the American people really liked the person they saw going through their small town in 1861. All right, we've got two questions. Uh, the first one is from Tom Best. Uh, he asks, any estimates as to the size of crowds in key cities along his journey? Well, they were huge crowds for that time. Uh, I think I remember reading about a crowd of about 25,000 in Cleveland, I think. I, I, I might have that number wrong. And then more like 50,000 people in the streets of New York City, which is still a huge number. I mean, if you were to see a crowd of 50,000, that's like, you know, filling up a college football game on a Saturday. And these were in smaller cities with smaller streets. So these were very substantial crowds. Really, probably, I have to think, among the largest crowds any president or president-elect had ever seen, because presidents did not really speak to large crowds up to that point in American history. They were they were elected, usually from a small town. They went to Washington, which was a small town. They just lived there. Uh, they did not speak to Congress in the 19th century. They, they, they delivered a handwritten message instead of the State of the Union. So the idea of a president giving a big speech was was not really known, and Lincoln is suddenly doing it every couple of hours uh, during during the train trip. Um, so these these were much bigger crowds than, and, and when you add them all together, I mean, I think I estimated maybe he saw a million people over thirteen days, and nothing like that had ever happened in American history. Um, and then I, I see the other question: anecdotes or events. Recalling Champaign County and Lincoln's earlier lawyering, I mean, he probably was saying things like that in the small towns, including in Champaign County. Uh, some of that speech is written down, and I put it in my book that he he quoted a poem about uh, how there, there, there might be clouds in the sky, but the sun would break through, and then right at that moment, the sun broke through. So that must have been a pretty special time when he came through Tolono, but he was honestly st stopping for like a minute in these small towns in Champaign County. It wouldn't have been a long time where he really got to meet a lot of people. It was just like the train would stop. He'd go to the back car where there was a little platform and give some charming short remarks and then keep, keep moving. Um, I'd like to, I wish I could remember, was there lawyering he was doing he probably was involved with putting some of the trains through Champaign County because he did so much work for the Illinois Central. Um, I can comment as the former museum manager. Great. So he um, <clears throat> he did actually do some law lawyering in uh, Urbana. We have a kind of a funny anecdote in our museum that uh, Judge Cunningham, who was a local historian and politician of note, um, in his own right said apparently he um, he was getting his photograph taken in Urbana and his jacket was either dirty or it wasn't really going to show up on on photograph and because Lincoln was su such an odd size to his frame the only spare jacket they had was too small on him so he actually was uh, according yeah. to people who noticed this photograph they said he was actually stifling a laugh when this photograph was taken and you wow. can kind of see it so it's one of the rare times you can see his humor in a be in incredible a he, so that's an unknown lincoln photograph it's not unknown but it's it's one that was taken in town and so that's the only major anecdote i remember from urbana if you have any way of um, getting access to it i'd love to see it i, I don't think i've ever seen that so sure um, i'd love to send that thank you um, we have another question in chat. Oh, great. And then after this, I, I think I should go around the hour because I'm supposed to go out and meet some friends for dinner and I don't want to be late for, for seeing them, but, um, 
but I'm happy to answer. It's you know a hard question, but a, a, I think I can answer it. Um, yes, do I see qualities in Lincoln that distinguish greatness from something a little less than greatness? And I I really do see personal growth happening, and I think that is a quality of greatness. There there are many. Um, but I mean, and, and courage, courage is another courage in that he refused to be intimidated by all the news of these assassins lurking. And, you know, they also might've been out in the crowds. He's speaking every day, many times in front of people very close to him, exposed to danger. And he never stopped doing that. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of, physical courage in, in Lincoln, but a tremendous amount of growth. And my evidence for that is the way he starts to speak more and more beautifully. He's a little bit hesitant and ordinary at the beginning of the trip. But by the end, when he's talking about what the declaration means to him personally, it's very beautiful. And that is, you know, it's the theme of the Gettysburg Address. He he says it even more beautifully at Gettysburg than he does in Philadelphia in 1861. But these are deep emotions that he's getting across to people. So it's not just a, a specific, ordinary political thought. It's something welling up inside of how much he loves the country, how much he's willing to do to save it. And we all know, of course, now that he gave his life to save the United States of America, but also what the best parts of our history meant. And that's a message that I still think is very relevant, that we, you know, we know a lot about our history, good and bad, and we know a lot more about slavery than we used to. And I mean, that's important. We want to know everything, and we're not afraid of the, the truth. But he kept coming back to this idea at the beginning of our history that all people have a right to make the best of their situation, they're, they're black or white or whatever background. And you get a feeling from Lincoln's, the way he talks about the declaration, he really believed in that. And he was just trying to help us live up to our own founding principles that were written down way before he was born. And there's something very beautiful in that. And I think that's why he's still the president whose words move us the most. They they do me any any way. Um, there was something very sincere in there that you can't fake. And I did I read that a lot in my reading of the small town papers. There was a lot of commentary that there is something very authentic about this guy. And that's something that's so hard. Everyone wants to be thought of as authentic. I'm sure uh, all of the people running for president now feel that they are authentic and want to be thought of as authentic. But in reality, you know, a lot of the people out there in the electorate think all politicians are fake on either side and that a lifelong politician especially maybe shouldn't be trusted. And Somehow Lincoln broke through and people really wanted to believe him and, and did. So there was something in just the way he handled himself. And we know we can't see film, we can't hear audio, but the, the accounts I read describe a very special person who was really connecting with these crowds over and over again. Yeah, I, I, I asked that question, Ted, and I, I know you've got to go because we talk so much about in, in political science about the the, the force of Lincoln, the force of of uh, the president in, in shaping the circumstance uh, that the country faces, that, that the world faces. But I'm very curious about how that which he faced elicited some sort of greatness in him that was that was that was latent, or in in the latencies of his own personality that it that required that required just the kind of things that you seem to be talking about to bring forth. I, I, you follow me? Yeah, thank you for the photo. I just got the link. Um, well, I think 
It's a simple answer, but I think it it's true, is that the magnitude of the crisis helped him grow a lot. You know, no one had ever come into a situation this bad. And probably, I don't think anyone has since. Um, even things that were very bad in our, our lifetime, like 9-11 was less than a year into the, the George W. Bush presidency or the, um, the financial crisis of 2008 and 9 for Obama. But um, nothing was even remotely as bad as what Lincoln had to deal with. I'm just going to click these photo links so I can have them later. And um, I mean, the country was literally splitting, falling, falling apart. And there was severe anger everywhere in politics and not very much confidence in him. So he was starting behind the eight ball without very much experience in politics and hadn't gone to college. He was from a, a great distance away, which, I mean, you all know, but I tried to put into my book that this was a real disadvantage. Like he was from 800 miles away or more from Washington, DC. He had no friends in Washington. So the degree of difficulty was overwhelming. And the task was just, you know, how do you, put all these pieces back together. And somehow, miraculously, he he did it. And I think it began with just finding a confidence in himself and building up that special rapport between him and the, the American people, not even his political allies, but the people themselves. He he really did that. So um and 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 I think it helped that he he came from the, the background he did. It turned into an asset that he had not gone to college, and it turned into an asset that he hadn't held office for a while because he wasn't tainted. In a moment, kind of like the one we're in, where everyone was really sick of politics, he could say, I am an outsider. I'm, I'm not like everyone else. And I think that helped him. Um, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, so I, I guess I should go, but Will has my email. And feel free to uh, shoot me an email if you have other questions. And I'm, if, if you read my book, thank you. I'm, I, I appreciate it. I'm still getting nice comments. Oh, and I don't want to forget to say, one of the nicest comments of all came from Liz Cheney. Uh, Liz Cheney read my book during the um, all the trouble around November, December, January of 2020 and 21. And she really liked it. And it, I she has... I've only met her once, but she let me know it helped her sort of form her principled stand that, you know, whatever party we are in, we don't, we, we, we accept the results of our elections and we don't, we don't, um, we don't allow mobs to tell us what to do. And so she's obviously very prominent now in politics and she's just written a book and in her book, she mentions my book briefly in passing as something. And I, I'm happy not, just for me, but I, I think Lincoln would be proud that his message of um, believing in this country, believing in the rule of law, believing in all the different parts of this country, he, he did believe, you know, he he was a kind of a Southerner. He's born in Kentucky, and he did not want the South to think of him as an enemy, and I think he'd be proud if his words are still bringing Americans together instead of driving us apart, so... Um, thank you. Thank you for your nice. All right. Nice well, yeah. Um, thank you all for joining tonight. And once again, thank you, Ted, for being able to join us. Um, it wouldn't have been without uh, the efforts of my predecessor, Connor Munson, that we wouldn't have been able to bring you here today to us. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, uh, you're welcome to email me. Uh, you can find my email on our website and I can relay them to Ted if you have any further questions for him. Otherwise, uh, our next history talk is going to be January 18th at the Champaign Public Library. Ryan Ross uh, from the Alumni Association for the University of Illinois will be talking about the history of homecoming on campus. That talk, much like this one, will be recorded. So just in the chance that you'd like to look back at it and be able to hear Ted talk again or hear any of our other history talks, you can find them available on our website.